Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Sasquatch Trail Runners Run Venture Facebook Live series. My name is Kim Levinsky. I am the owner and race director for Sasquatch Trail Runners in New Jersey. Tonight, I'll be interviewing Nicholas Thompson, ultra runner and CEO for The Atlantic. Before we jump into the interview, I'm going to share a few updates on what is going on in the wonderful world of Sasquatch trail running. Uh, but first of all, I want to say that we're having very, very heavy rain and thunderstorms right here in New Jersey. And Nick just said the same thing by him. So I'm, I'm slightly concerned that the power will cut the internet. If that happens, just stay tuned and we're going to figure out a way to troubleshoot and get back online. So first of all, thank you to everybody who came out to our Backyard Squatch Ultra this past weekend at Stoke State Forest in Branchville, New Jersey. We had 30 runners come out, all ages and paces participate. And we saw some pretty incredible accomplishments out there. Many runners left the race with some massive, massive distance PRs. So congratulations. If you haven't heard, we were blowing up social media. Scott Snell won the race with 36 yards, which means he ran for 36 hours, completing 4.1667 miles every hour on the hour, which equates to 150 miles. 150, which I'm, I'm, I need to find out if that's kind of a, if that is a record for a first year backyard event. So Justin Kowski got the assist with 35 yards. If you're familiar with this race, you know that there can't be a winner without somebody assisting. So that was a team effort for us to see these huge, huge mileage numbers on the weekend. So with the win, Scott is going to be headed out to the Capitol Backyard Ultra in Virginia next May. So that is a golden ticket event. And if he wins that, he's going to grab a spot on the USA team that will be competing next year for the big backyard uh, championship. So thanks to you guys, we are donating over 600 pairs of new socks to our charity partner, Success. We've been supporting them since 2018. And with this last race, that brings our total giving of over 2,600 pairs of socks. So they give these out to those in need around New Jersey. And we always like to give this PSA. If you didn't know, socks are the number one requested item in homeless shelters. So we are so proud to partner with them. Thank you guys for your generosity. A lot of you guys donated during the registration process and then a bunch of you brought socks to the race. So that is just awesome. Next up for us is the Great Pizza Run. That is on Sunday, <clears throat> September 19th at the South Mountain Reservation in West Orange, New Jersey. This is not a race. This is a fun run hike. So it's a it's a social thing. It's a great opportunity for you to come out and meet new runners and hikers and to enjoy some pretty amazing pizza. So we are honored to have Brooklyn Pizziola, Miriam Weiskin on site cooking all you can eat pizza for everybody. So you can get your ticket for that on our event uh, website is sasquatchtrailrunning.com. You'll see the link Just scroll down a little bit and click on the great pizza run for that ticket. So next up in our race series is the last squatch standing that's on October 30th at the South Mountain Reservation in West Orange. So this race just puts a squatchy twist on what we just did at the Backyard Ultra. So at the last squatch standing, you have to complete a one mile loop in the allotted time or you get eliminated. So time comes off of the clock every loop. So this is really a test of both endurance and speed. So it's a very, very fun event. If you're not even interested in participating, come out to the race. It is really, really fun to watch all these miles go down. So you can register for that on ultrasignup.com. And then later in November on the 27th of Thanksgiving weekend, we are having our annual Squatchy Leftovers race. So you can sign up for 5K, 10K, 25K, or a 50K. And that's also at the South Mountain Reservation in West Orange, New Jersey. So if you're not familiar with Sasquad, we are all about uh, building our community, being welcoming to all ages and paces, and we love to have families come out to our events. So we encourage you to check out the rest of the races in our series for 2021. That's on our website, which is sasquadtrailrunning.com. So, okay, so the reason you're all here, Nicholas Thompson, I'm so excited to talk with Nick tonight. Before we jump into the interview, I'm going to share a little bit of an intro for him. So I want to set the stage of this incredible man who's joining us tonight. And if you are tuning in now, I'm going to give another PSA that we are having heavy rainstorms right now here in New Jersey. And Nick is as well on his end. So hopefully, fingers cross all your fingers that the internet stays online and we don't have to cut out. Um, but okay, let me read Nick's 
uh, great uh, introduction here. So he is the CEO of The Atlantic, the former editor-in-chief of Wired. Under his leadership, Wired won numerous awards for design and reporting and launched a highly successful paywall. Thompson also wrote many features for the publication, including two cover stories on Facebook that have been cited multiple times in Congress. He's a former contributor to CBS News, where he regularly appeared on CBS This Morning and CBS Sunday Morning. He's the co-founder of Activist, a national magazine, award-winning digital publication and multimedia content management system that was sold to WordPress in 2018. Thompson previously served as the editor of NewYorker.com. And before the New Yorker, Thompson was the senior editor at Wired, where he was assigned and edited the story that was the basis for the Oscar-winning film Argo. In 2009, his book, The Hawk and the Dove, um, was published to critical acclaim. He has long been a competitive runner. In 2019, he was ranked as one of the top 20 Masters Marathoners in the world. And most recently in 2021, he set the American record for men 45 plus in the 50K race. And I want to share the stats on that because it's just unbelievable. He raced this 50K in three hours, four minutes, 36 seconds. Where if you do the math, that's just under a six minute pace. And that's what broke the age 45 to 49 record, which was previously held by ultramarathon legend Michael Wardian. So, okay, that was a mouthful. Nick, come and join us. All right. Thank you so here? much. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for coming on tonight. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks well, for having me on. I hope we yeah. last. Yeah. We have to thank our mutual friend, Charlie Gaddle, for making the connection. Oh, it's fun. It's great. Yeah, that was nice of him to connect us. It's so awesome. So, um, all right. So anyone who's familiar with, new, with you, they know the majority of your interviews, they usually focus on your job and your <laughs> publications, right? And, you know, I've, I've been researching you the last couple of weeks, and we could probably pick any topic, like you being kidnapped in Morocco, or you were a street performer in New York City. But this is a running podcast. So let's start with your running story. Um, oh. You know, I'm familiar with it, but I would love for you to share, like, when did you start running? How did you start running? Just give us, give us the rundown of your running yeah. story. Um, I'm happy to. And I'll also say that I'm in awe of the race you just put on and being able to run four miles every hour for 36 hours. is just crazy. Like I Insane. do a lot of things that are a little crazy, but that's crazy. <laughs> um, so I started running to some degree when I was about five years old or six years old. My dad was one of those guys who took up marathon in the late seventies or eighties. He'd never been athletic and just got the bug and he took me out from time to time. So I'd run a mile, two miles with him running around the block. Um, my parents got divorced. He moved away. I stopped. And then I took it up again in high school. And I took it up only because I was cut from the basketball team. And I got cut. And the only sport I could join was track. I joined the track team and I wasn't very good. And then I had this one magical day where, you know, I just for some reason obliterated every time I'd run before and set a, you know, school record for sophomores. Uh, and so then I was, you know, locked into it. Turned out I was good. I did very well in high school and I went to Stanford, which has an amazing running program. I wasn't good enough there. And so I left, I dropped, you know, um, dropped off the team at the end of freshman year. And then I didn't really run seriously or competitively. I entered a marathon here and there, but I didn't really focus on it until I was about 29. Started running again. I ran a 243 marathon, which was great. And then for my all my 30s, I stayed there running 243, 242, 245, run about a marathon a year. Um, and then at about age 42 or 43, started to take the sport much more seriously and got much faster. And see in the intro, I you know ended up taking you know 15 minutes off my marathon PR, uh, or I guess 10 minutes off my PR, 15 minutes off where I started there um, at age 44. And so I'm much faster in my 40s than my 30s, but there you go. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's, that's definitely something I would love to chat with you about. You just made the statement you're faster now than you were when you were younger. I just happened to read a whole article that was the basis of that um, <laughs> publication. So but I won't spill the beans. I'd love for you to share like what, what turned that corner? What, um, what did you make changes or was it just like a change in your training or your focus? What was it that made that shift for you? 
there are a couple of ways to answer that. So it's a very, it's a, a complicated question, and I'm not sure that I, that even I quite know the answer right now, because if you had asked me that two years ago, I would have given you a different answer because I hadn't come to some realization. So on a most basic level, I changed the way I train, right? I started talking to elite coaches. These coaches from Nike reached out. They said, do you want to run this experiment with me, with us? And I said, of course. And so I trained some of, I changed some of how I trained, right? I changed a little bit about my diet. I started doing more speed work, increased my mileage slightly, started wearing those fancy shoes. I started monitoring my heart rate really carefully. Um, so that's kind of one answer, right? I did like all of these things that are supposed to make you 1% better, right? I combine all these things, marginal gains, you, you add four things that make you 1% better, you add them together, so maybe you're not quite 4% better, but you're better. That's part of it. A bigger part of it though was this, and this is the thing I didn't realize until much later, which is um, a psychological breakthrough. So what had happened in my running career is that at I had run the first 243 when I was I don't know, 29 or 30, 30. And then I had gotten really sick. I had gotten a form of cancer, right? You still see the scar on my neck. And it had taken about two years to recover from that. And then when I recovered, I ran 243 again. It was sort of the most magical experience of my life. And what I think I only realized later, later is that throughout my 30s and my early 40s, I was just trying to stay at a steady point. Like psychologically, I wasn't prepared to go faster because I didn't, all I wanted to do was to be the person that I'd been before I got sick. Mm -hmm. And it took some kind of a psychological forcing mechanism for me to make the mental leap to get faster. So that's part of it. And then I also think that part of it was probably, you know, I, I ran this fast. I mean, there's a theory of mourning that one of the ways to mourn is to carry the person you're mourning with you while you do something. And I think what happened, my father died in 2017. And so I think the sort of the more intense running may have been, even though it wasn't conscious, a way of, you know, holding on to his, his memory. So all of those things put together, like the different training, the different diet, or core exercises, speed work, you know, all that, um, combined with a psychological breakthrough of my sickness and then the way I dealt with my father. I think that probably all is what led to me going a little bit faster. That's incredible. And could we, could we talk a little bit about your 50K that you just... Yeah. Destroyed pretty much. Um, how long was this a goal that you had for a long time? Like you, you had your sights set on the 50 K or was it something that kind of evolved, uh, recently? It was something that evolved. I think I came up with the idea, um, during COVID maybe. Um, and I was trying to, I had been planning to run the London marathon COVID hit, everything was canceled. I can't remember exactly when I like looked through the record book, I was going to turn 45 that summer. And like, well, 45, like, like no one's racing, you know, what should I do? Uh, and I saw that the, you know, 45 plus record was attainable. And so I had planned to run a 50K in Vermont, maybe in September, and it got canceled. Um, and then I'd sort of put the goal aside because I couldn't find a good race. And then out of the blue in maybe um, December or January of last year, this guy, Josh Cox, uh, who's Des Linden's agent and a you know, former wonderful runner of his own rights, who I know via social media, texted me and said, hey, you want to come pace Des in a 50K. Uh, she's gonna try to set the world record. And I said, hell yeah, I'd love to pace Des Linden in a 50K to set the world record. And I knew that the women's world record was about the same as the men's 45 plus. So my plan had been to pace Des, but then I watched her on Strava and it was clear that like her training was nuts. Like she wasn't gonna just try to break the record. She's gonna try to break it by like seven minutes. And so I wrote to Josh and I said, hey, Josh, I don't think I can run with Des She's clearly going to try to run sub three hours or 50K, but can I still do the race and try to break the men's record in the 40, in the, in the 50K? And he said, totally. So I went out there, there were, I don't know, five, 10 of us in the race and uh, I got it. Incredible. And this was out in Oregon, right? Yeah, it was out on the Rao River, um, which is a little bit north of Eugene. I'd never been to Eugene, you're running capital of the world. Um, so it's a very flat course, it's a beautiful day. It was all set up, right? It was because you know, it was Des trying to set the world record, like there's some infrastructure to make it, make it a good race and do it on a good day. And, you know, wasn't a lot of wind, all the things you want as a runner, you know, 50 degree weather, not a lot of wind, pretty flat course, not all kinds of crazy turns that, you know, where you can't really run the tangents. Um, and I had a, you know, pace behind, Ryan Hall was pacing a runner of his. So I got a pace behind Ryan Hall on his bicycle, which is hilarious. <laughs> Yeah. And I know you've talked about in some of your other interviews, how 
and you, you alluded to it just now. It was like, it was the perfect day where everything came together. So what did that look like? What were the factors that it felt like everything was clicking? Well, for my training, um, yeah, the training had worked out well. I hadn't gotten injured. I hadn't gotten sick. Um, you know, I had changed jobs and like gotten a puppy, right? There'd been a bunch of like life things that were, you know, complicated. I got three little kids. Like there are a lot of things. My training is always disrupted and always a mess, but there wasn't anything that, um, you know, I didn't hurt my knee. I didn't get tendonized, right? So there wasn't any, I hadn't missed a long run. So the training had been good. Um, I felt like, you know, and not just good in the sense that I had gotten hurt, but that in the sense that for the sort of eight weeks leading up to the race, I felt like I was getting faster every week, right? And you, you can't get faster every week indefinitely, like you crash, right? So I felt like I was right at about the peak. I felt like I had timed it. I timed it very nicely. Um, and then I flew out there and I got a good night's sleep, right? I didn't get sick from the day. All the, you know, there's so many things that can go wrong in a race, right? And your shoe can come untied. You can get sick to your stomach, right? And if you're trying to break a record, right? I was trying to break Mike Wardian's record. Mike Wardian's no joke. Like I knew I needed to have a good day. So I needed good weather. I needed good wind. I needed a good race. I needed to pace it evenly, right? You can go out and you run the first mile at 545 instead of 555 and you're toast, right? I needed to like execute it well. And, you know, I did. I I, remember, I looked at my, I think my 10 mile splits were something like, not exactly right, but they're like 5907, 5911, 5908. Like it, I ran it very evenly, which is exactly how you do it in a course like that. So um, it all it all worked out and I was, I was lucky. I got some good advice. Maybe it was the night before where I called a friend who's really smart about running and talking about how, maybe I was talking about how hard it was and I never raced a 50K. And, you know, if your carbohydrate supplies run out after 20 miles, you have to rely on fats and proteins. Like, you know, this is my first real ultra. I mean, I'd run more than 30 miles in training, but I'd never done a race. Mm. Um, and he was like, okay, hold on, Nick. What you got to think about is think about something you did that was harder. And then think about this, right? Think about something that makes this seem easy, not something that makes this seem hard. Don't think about the variables that are new. Think about the variables that are old. And I was like, okay. And so then I adjusted my frame and I thought, well, you know, I ran a marathon at a much faster pace, mm. not that long ago. And I kind of shifted my perspective and I went into the race a little more relaxed. I think because of that, uh, I wasn't nervous, more confident. And then, um, you know, during the race felt pretty good, pretty good. It was about mile 18. My coach was out there and he remembers. And I was like, I don't, I think I'm going a little fast. And he started getting nervous, but really only about there did it go badly. Uh, and then at about mile 28, where I was like, God, what am I doing? I can't do this. Um, but all my miles were through the same. I felt good and I got it. I just love what you just said about, you know, drawing on past experiences, because I mean, how that's what I love about running is you can take all of these lessons you learn on the trail or the road and then use it when things get hard. I mean, what a great strategy yeah. for coping when things are like really going tough instead of focusing on all the variables and the unknown you can draw back on past experiences. Yeah, I think it's a good lesson for life too, right? Okay, so this thing I have to deal with is really hard, right? And I have to solve this really hard problem. But you know, I actually, I solved this harder problem before or like this is going badly. Okay, but let's not focus on what's going badly. Let's focus on like how we're going to solve it. And let's focus on this was a more complicated thing that I made work. So it's a really, it's a really, as you know, as with so much in running, there's so many lessons from running that, you know, work pretty well in the rest of your life. I love that. That's, I mean, that's why we do it, right? That's yeah. why we run. Um, so just like, you know, Scott Snell, he just ran 150 miles in 36 hours. That's hard for me to, even though I saw it, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around you saying that you ran this 50 K in three, some hours. That is just mind boggling to me. What did it feel like when you finished? Was it like you knew you did it and you crushed it. Was it surreal? What was that feeling when you, when you got the record? Um, you know, I kind of feel it's like, maybe there's this sort of like glow. I mean, I guess the thing, you know, it's interesting is that when you're running a race, like I felt like probably every moment from mile 20, I felt like I was going to get it. I was like, you know, I think I'm going to get this. Right. And like most races that have gone well for me, you realize pretty early on that you're going to, it's going to work. Um, your body, you know, and you're inside your body. So when I crossed the finish line, I was just fulfilling what I'd been thinking about for the last hour. Um, but it, it was, it felt really good. And it felt really good for a couple of reasons. One, so I had set a very specific goal, 
and I hit that specific goal and that feels great. Right. Two, it was like, I had done something I'd never done before. And then three, it was like, there was a small group of people there, but they were all pumped. Like they were all really rooting for me. They had me break the tape and like, I drank champagne out of my shoe with Des Linden, who's one of the you know greatest runners of all time. Um, and just, you know, wonderful, a wonderful person. And like Josh, the agent who you know, set that, the all ages record in the 50 K was there cheering. My coach was there who guided me through this whole process last mm-hmm. three or four years, Steve Finley. Um, it was, it felt, it felt really good to have, you know, a small group of people who were like, everyone was rooting for me. Everyone wanted me to get that. I love that. Okay. I have to ask about the champagne in the shoe. Like, did you take your shoe off and then pour it in? Was this a, another shoe you had on hand? What did it taste like? I have a lot of questions about the shoe. Okay. So it was a little strange. So this, the race was sponsored by New Balance. And so it was going to be a New Balance photograph, but I had run in Nike shoes. And so Des Linden's husband, who had also run the race, offered me his shoe. Um, and that <laughs> seemed so gross. I couldn't do it. And so I went and I grabbed, I had actually, the sh- I drank out of the shoes I had warmed up in. Um, so it wasn't, the shoe didn't have, it had sweat from three hours before, but not from 10 minutes before. <laughs> and you know, it didn't, it tasted fine. It tasted like shoey champagne. But, <laughs> but it was great. You know, I, I, one of the things about my running career is that I was never, like I was good in high school, but I never, I was never an elite runner. Like I never, I think one of the, one of the reasons why I'm able to run in my forties is that I was never, I clearly have like a lot of latent talent and good genes. You know, had I stuck through it in college, maybe I could have been a good runner in my twenties, but I didn't have that experience. I didn't win a lot of races. And so it's kind of a new thing. It wasn't like I'd like drunk out of my shoe and set records when I was 23 (laughs) because at 23, I barely ran. So anyway, it was fun. That's so great. Yeah. I saw the picture of you drinking, you guys drinking from the shoes on the podium. I was like, who came up with this idea? <laughs> yeah. I was guessing. So, what, um, I mean, I'm sure everybody's asked you what's next. Do you have your sights on something else? I mean, besides coming to a Sasquatch event, obviously what well, else? I would love to, you know, I think, I think what I'm going to do with my running is I'm going to keep trying to see how fast I can get in the marathon. Like the marathon is the event I love. It's that my dad ran. You know, I'm going to see until I stop, until I realize that it can't get faster, which, you know, I'm 46 years old. It's going to happen pretty Mm -hmm. soon if it hasn't happened already. But I'm going to run the Chicago Marathon um, Mm -hmm. this fall. And then I hope the New York Marathon, depending if I recover. Um, So that's there. And then if I go faster, who knows, maybe I'll run another marathon. But at some point I'll, I'll switch and I'll start trying to experiment with, maybe I'll do one of your crazy backyard runs, or maybe I'll go try to run a 50 miler or... You know, I love mountain running. Um, and I, every year I do these Garmin runs. Probably a lot of your listeners and viewers do out in, uh, out in the Catskills, 18 miles yep. up on three or four mountains. Um, I'm just not good at mountain running. I mean, I'm fine. I'm just not particularly good at it. I might start doing more of that since it's the kind of running I love the most. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a perfect segue because my next question was, was going to be about trail running because this is, uh, it is Sasquatch trail running, right? Of course. So can you share a little bit of your, do you have a trail running story? What's your relationship to the trails? Well, you know, I, I was a kid who loved trails and being outside, right? So I spent my childhood going up, you know, hiking up mountains and I, I just, I loved it. Um, when, I, when I stopped the Stanford team, I started this thing, my sophomore, junior and senior year is called the Stanford Mountain Running Team, where we would, uh, once a week, we would get up at five in the morning and we would bicycle to some mountain and we'd run up and down it. Um, and we'd bicycle back and go to our classes at eight. Um, you know, did that throughout college, which I, which I love. Um, I've loved running, running in the woods, running in trails, running on mountains. I just, I'm not, I'm not as fast at it, right? When I want run the escarpment run, like the guys who finish before me and ahead of me are like 10 minutes slower in the marathon. Like I'm just, I'm a little bit slower, particularly on the downhills. So racing isn't really the, the thing for me, but if, if the question came up, Nick, you can have an hour, you can run on the trails, you can run on the roads, 100% I'm taking the trails. Mm. Hey, we love to hear that. Yeah. Well, you know, this is being streamed live through Facebook. So I'm going to pop in the chat. I know we've got a question from one of our runners, Jeremy Erbach. So he wants to know, and this is a 
this was on my list. I'm glad, Jeremy, you asked it. How do you balance such a demanding professional life with your training schedule? So this, this is a nice segue into maybe getting into more of your career. I think it's a really awesome question for you to launch off of. Yeah, it's a hard question too, because I have, you know, I have my job, which is very intense. I travel a lot, which is complicated. I have three children to whom I'm devoted and to whom I spend a ton of time. And they're, you know, now 7, 11, 13. So I do a couple of things to try to make it work. So one, I try to make my running as integrated with my work life as possible. So many of my miles are to and from the office, right? So instead of taking the subway to work, I run to work, right? And I take a shower at the gym nearby and I'm in the office. Um, during COVID, I stopped doing that. Um, but that's, that's part of it. Two, I try to be very efficient about, um, like I don't, I don't spend a lot of time planning my runs. I don't spend a lot of time recovering from my runs. I don't do a lot of extra core work, right? The amount of time I spend running every week is really just the time I spend running, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and I don't worry, like I don't spend a bunch of time like looking at the calendar, thinking, oh, it's gonna be rainy, it's gonna be hot, it's gonna be humid. I just go run whenever I can in between work. So this morning, like, okay, there's one window to run. It's like between 8, 10 and 8.50, let's go do it. Um, and then I don't run that many miles. So I try to bound and then, all, sorry. And also when I'm running my recovery runs, I'm sometimes I'm literally on the phone at work. Are you right? really? <laughs> um, off, usually I'm listening to podcasts, right? I'll be listening to the Atlantic yeah. podcast, better podcast, listening to news, right? There's a lot of, you know, listen to audio books when I run um, yeah. that are important for work. So there's, a, and, and you do that and you lose some of the benefits of running, right? The whole point of running is to you know, break with the rest of your life and have a meditative space. And in some ways I get that the most when I'm doing my workouts, or sometimes my long runs, I'll just turn off the audiobooks. Um, but that's, that's part of it. The other thing that I think is important is I think that running, I don't, I don't, I've never figured out exactly where the line is, but I think that discipline is additive. And I think that being disciplined about your running can make you more disciplined in your work, right? And like that the skills you learn to be a disciplined runner and to know that, okay, on Tuesday, I'm going to run eight by 800 and on you know, Thursday, I'm going to run four by two miles with two minute recovery from, you know, 1120 to 1050, right? And the discipline it takes to do that every week increases the discipline that you have during the day for your job, mm -hmm. right? And helps you like stay on task. Right. Some people argue the opposite, that like discipline is finite, right? And that if you use some of your discipline running, you will have less from work. I think that's not true. Um, so, you know, and there are other things that are beneficial, right? Like I don't, <laughs> I don't stay up late, like drinking, right? Because- right. I got to run at six and right. you know, if I don't stay up late drinking, like I'm probably going to function better at work the next day too. So there are a bunch of ways where it kind of works together. But I think the, I think the main answer is, I think it's kind of in the discipline thing. I think, I think that the, there's clearly a level of running that would be detrimental. Like maybe if I was running a hundred miles a week and I was focusing on more and I was doing like, I don't know, cryotherapy afterwards, like it would take away from the work. Um, but I think right now I found a pretty good balance where it's, it's helpful to the job. Mm. It's awesome. So I think the, um, our viewers are, they've got an eye on my, my sheet over here. They're asking all the questions that I have written down. So um, <laughs> this is coming from my good friend, Jana Shurnetz. So here is her comment. I've been listening to podcasts on know your why. This is so important, not only in running, but this concept spills over into all that we do. What is your why? Does it change from event to event? How do you use this mindset and other facets of your life? It's such a great question. Wait, so the why as in like, why do I do this? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the why of why I run. Um, deep question, Nick, deep. It's a hard question, right? So I started running like literally because I needed to do a sport. Right. And then I kept running because it gave me self-confidence. Right. And it was the first thing in high school that I was like genuinely good at. Right. And in some ways it's a similar answer for the rest of my life. Like having something that you're good at gives you kind of confidence and you know, makes you less insecure about the rest of life. And so being able to go out there and run and run it well is very useful. Secondly, you know, I have this, you know, very stressful regimented day where I block yeah. out the 15 minute windows and, um, you know, I have a lot of hard tasks during the day. And so running 
often is like the one moment where there's like a structured break, right? And where it's, you know, you get up and you cook for the kids, you talk to the kids, you, you do all the things you do. And then you like, you, you break, you run to the office, then you do your job and you run home, right? And so it's, it's kind of a like a meditative part of the day, which I think is, which I think is, which I think is useful. Um, and, you know, then it's the other, I mean, it's also, it's like, it's pretty fun and it's a way, in some ways it's like literal exploring, right? Because anytime I go to a new city, I go and I run around the city, right? And it's the way I learn the city, right? And I still do it in Brooklyn, right? Where I haven't been to that part of Queens. I'll go run to that part of Queens, right? Or um, I really, I really enjoy going to see, or I don't know, like my run home now, we move, I move jobs. And so I moved offices. It's pretty amazing, right? And I get to run through different parts of the Bowery in Chinatown. Like it's a good way to explore the city and to see things and to expand your mind a little bit. I was just up in Maine. I got to run on all these wonderful mountains. Um, so it's partly about exploration. And then it's also partly like, it goes back to the meditative thing where your, your mind drifts and moves in a certain way when you run that it doesn't do at other points in the day. So I think it's just a healthy part of having a, having a balanced life for me. Mm. Do you ever experience times of where you're, um, you know, the term burnout, have you ever experienced that in your, in your running career? I've never burned out. Um, you know, I stopped because I wasn't good enough and I th thought I had other things to do. Um, I, you know, during my thirties where I would basically just run the New York marathon and then not really run for six months, it wasn't so much burnout as it was just not wanting to get hurt and having other priorities in life. Um, I don't think I've ever reached a point where I'm like, I'm just running too much. Let me take some time away from it. It's always, I've always wanted sort of more time to run. Mm. Um, I don't think I've ever had burnout. I don't think I've ever had burnout professionally either. I'm very fortunate in that I've never, I don't think I've ever had to, you know, since the time I was 22, I don't think I've ever had to take a break because I was sort of exhausted or stressed. I've just always worked very hard and always just kept going. Yeah. That's gotta be uh, have you ever thought about why? I mean, I'd have some ideas, but I, I don't mean, know. That's, that's I wonder whether, I wonder whether it's, it's similar, right? Like running to such a degree, like one of the lessons of running, I mean, it wouldn't be I, one of the lessons of running is like how cumulative it is. Right. And how like, you know, in order to succeed, you have to just put in the work every day. Right. And you have to like, you have to run two workouts in a long run every week. Right. You have to go, you have to get up, you have to go and do it. Um, and that lesson might have been a, you know, kind of useful lesson for, you know, my career, right? You got to go write the story. Okay. And go write the story. Right. And so instead of coming up and like very le early learning and running and very much taking a heart was something I've taken a heart since I started taking it seriously that you just go and do it. Right. Whether it's rainy, whether it's stormy, whether it's snowy, whether it's icy, whether it's hot, whether it's cold, whether you got to, you know, your sore throat when you woke up in the morning. And so I think maybe, maybe that helps in the job, right? Knowing that like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try to do the best I can on whatever I'm supposed to do today. Like mm -hmm. regardless of whether it's hot, cold, or I'm tired, or I'm, you know, the boss has been grumpy, whatever it is. I, th I think they're, they're, they're similar lessons in each. Yeah, totally. I, I know I've had a lot of conversations with friends about it. And I think a lot of times you don't even realize how much running is equipping you to handle mm -hmm. situations until you're knee deep in it. And you realize yeah. like, Oh, I'm a, I'm a, I can do this. I'm right. equipped to. And, and until you, at least for me, until I stop and connect the dots of like, Oh, I've been really committed to training program. Um, and now I can handle stuff that maybe I couldn't before running. Yeah. I think it's probably, I think that's probably true. I think it does. It just, it helps in certain ways. I, you can also imagine it tipping in the other way where like the stress just becomes impossible and the running adds to the stresses. I just have been very fortunate to, to not yeah. have that happen. I mean, it's also the case, of course, like I totally failed out of the sport, right? When I was like 19 years old, like there's, when I was a sophomore and freshman in college, there's nothing more important to me than being a good runner. And I didn't cut it. Right. Like, so, you know, despite training incredibly hard. So there are all kinds of lessons I've learned from the sport, right? That like you learn the lesson there that no matter how hard you work, sometimes you're not good enough. Right. So that's mm -hmm. an interesting lesson to take to heart. <laughs> yeah. And that's the beauty of sports, right? I always, I used to coach at the college level and I'd always say, you know, sports are the, it's the sandbox of life, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, and I, I, this could go off and do a whole nother tangent, but I feel like youth sports is losing a little bit of that because of 
parental involvement. Anyway, uh, that's, that doesn't have to be a part of this interview, but those are real. We can talk about it for a second because it's something I think about a lot, right? So I have three boys and two of them are super ambitious about their sports, right? And they play this extremely competitive soccer club and, you know, where they're forced to do to, to commit to this sport more than I had to commit to anything until I yeah. was certainly in high school. Um, and so my wife and I have conversations like, is this healthy? Is this good? And our decision is, look, if they want to do this, right, if they really want to play at this level with this commitment, like, let's let them pursue it because there's something to learn from really going for it and really being ambitious. And right at some point it, it ends and you stop, right? Maybe it stops when they're 15, maybe it stops when they're 12, maybe it stops when they're yeah. 20, who knows? Um, but that in life, if you really love something, you really want to go for it as parents, our job is to support it. Mm. That's awesome. I would, I would love for you to share a little bit about your family. I know one of the articles that I read, you talked about how, um, it's a little bit of your cross training is oh, yeah. hanging out with your kids. I love for you to share a little bit about that. Yeah, it's totally, it's totally true. Right. So I haven't, I've been very fortunate in my running, right. Maybe one reason why I haven't had burnout is I haven't gotten hurt and like, why haven't, why haven't I gotten hurt? And, um, I had this revelation, um, it was last fall and I was starting to have like tendonitis in my knee for the first time. And I talked to, I met with a physical trainer, this guy named Michael Holder, so smart. And we were talking about stuff and he was like, so what do you do for cross training? Like, what, what do you do for core work? I said, like, I don't really do anything. He's like, we, we, and I was like, well, you know, I, I play soccer with my kids all the time. I play basketball. Like, you know, literally before this, we were doing this game in one of their bedroom where one of them would throw a size one soccer ball and you try to whack it with your arm and then you have to run to the stuffed animal. Like, <laughs> you know, that, like where you're moving and your body's engaged, but you're not actually, there's no, like, I'm not going to injure myself playing like whatever we're doing arm ball in the bedroom. Right. 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 And, you know, he was like, when did you last get hurt? I was like 12 years ago. He's like, when did you, how old your oldest kid? I was like 12 years. And it was sort of the realization that I had never gotten hurt since the kids were born. And I think it's partly because um, you know, I'm doing all this funny stuff with them where, I'm not pushing my, I'm not like in the gym, like, ah, right. Doing the kind of yeah. core work that makes you more likely to get hurt. Mm -hmm. I'm like goofing around, picking up the kids, tossing them around, climbing trees, like, you know, playing whatever the hell we're playing, right. Like throwing brooms and pretending it's a javelin <laughs> and it's strengthening your body in like small ways mm -hmm. that give you balance and core and um, that give you a little bit of what you need to prevent injuries without actually causing injuries, which so much of the strength work that people do does. Totally. I mean, what you're describing is functional fitness, right? Yeah. You're doing functional movements. Um, that really, I think translates to injury prevention. Totally. I'm doing, yeah, like that's, that, that is a much better way to put it than whatever I was saying, but like, yeah, I'm doing functional movements by like wrestling with my kids and a you know, four foot tall stuffed bear. Right. So <laughs> You know, you, I, I, never, I didn't do it because it would prevent my injury and prevent injuries, but it certainly, I think it does. Right. What sports are your kids involved with? Is, is any, any bit of running or are they in organized team sports? They're in organized soccer, but what, you know, my, this is actually great for this podcast, this sort of wonderful thing happened this summer. So my 11 year old, the middle kid, so the oldest guy who's 13, he and I went on this wonderful hike this summer. He does a lot of canoeing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff to do with him. Um, the 11 year old, um, he finished his soccer season in late June and he said he wanted to get faster for the next year. I said, well, I know how to do that. And so we went to the track and he ran, he ran a mile. He ran like 11 minutes. And then we started doing workouts and we did this great workout where I would do 1200s, which, you know, take whatever they take four minutes and he would do a mile. I do a 1200. Then he'd do a half mile. I do a 1200. He'd do a quarter. I do a 1200. And we did that maybe once a week, twice a week. And his mile time started going down. I went from 11 to 10 to nine to eight. And then um, like a month after we started, he ran a 658, right? Like big improvement, right? Wow. So it's gonna get better though. And so then he goes away to camp for nine days and comes back and there's a road race where we are up in Maine, five mile road race. And he's like, I, I want to do that. I said, okay. I pick him up from camp on a Sunday. We run four miles on Monday. We run five miles on Wednesday. We run late on Thursday. He runs the road race wins his age group, runs, wins the five mile group. Then um, come back. He's like, I, I was running a 5k, maybe 10 days later. He's like, I want to run the 5k. And so last Wednesday we go to ICANN stadium and uh, it's one of those tracksmith 5ks. And he, I put him in heat six um, in heat one, right? They're seated. 
uh, he run, he goes and eats six with all these adults. I tell him, okay, you're just gonna run, run, run eight twenties. Like that's what you can handle for 5k. And um, he kind of takes it out and he stays right on 820. And then he starts to pick it up. He runs the last mile. I'm like, I don't know, 730. It wins a sprint and like breaks the tape. <laughs> it's, the <coolest. laughs> it's a really beautiful photo of my kid and like a traction and singlet that my coach gave him, like breaking the tape. Huh. We, ran, we ran another 5k last Saturday. So, um, you know, he's not going to like his soccer training is crazy, right? They do many times a week. It's a very mm-hmm. intense coach. It's you know, one of the elite clubs, like it's going to subsume this running thing pretty soon. Um, but I think next summer we'll do it again. It's, it's, and it's wonderful. Like today there, you know, this rainstorm that we have, uh, he was going stir crazy and I was like, okay, let's go run. So we ran in the rainstorm for a mile and a half. It was fun. Mm. Nick, you are beaming talking about your son. It's oh, really, I'm so happy. It's I, love, I love doing stuff with all, with all of them. And I run with the little guy who's seven yeah. and I with the older guy. It's really fun. I love that so much. That's, that's just a beautiful thing. You know, we, yeah. we always talk about having, uh, we love having families at our event. I'll, I'll share the story. Scott Snell, who was at, you know, he ran the 150 miles. His whole family was there. He has three boys. They were all crewing for him. Really? And awesome. it's just, you know, it's a beautiful thing. So um, I'm going to pop back into the chat because we have a lot of chatter going on. And I know um, before when we talked last week, you said you were all about the surprise question. So hopefully you're good with me. Uh, Whatever you want to ask. Yeah. Hitting them, hitting them to you. So let's see. All right. We've got a question from this, is my good friend, Kaylin Hopkins. This is a great question. How necessary is running to your quality of life? For example, if you found yourself injured, do you believe that it would have a large impact on your quality of life? That's a good question. They're, they're hitting you with the deep stuff here, Nick. <laughs> well, i answer it. Um, Depends how, I mean, clearly if the injury was like debilitating to the degree where I couldn't do anything else, like I couldn't get out on the bike. Um, you know, I was, I was a little bit injured last year where there was about two weeks where I couldn't run and it was frustrating because I had set a big goal and, um, and I had to go out on the bike, um, you know, and I lost a fair amount of fitness but I don't think it ultimately affected my quality of life that much. You know, I probably have to ask my wife whether I was grumpier than normal, um, but I don't think so. Like I was still able to go biking, was still able to go outside, still able to get a bit of fresh air. Um, you know, if I had a, you know, the inter- a, a very interesting way to answer that question would be what would happen if I like doctor called and was like, hey, Nick, you know, you actually have a heart condition and you can't mm-hmm. sit for running, you know, you can, um, I think I'd still be fine if I could still go out there and hike um, and still go out into the woods and you go for a long hike and bring, put the pack on, bring the tent. Um, you know, I would miss the running, but I'd figure out a way to, I figure out a way to get most of what the running gives me right. um, without it. And you know, I'll get there soon enough. I mean, I'm 46, right? Again, like I'm not, it's, at some point it's going to, I'm going to break down. Like I'm pretty lucky to still be going, you know, who mm-hmm. knows where I'll be in a year, certainly five years. Like you've got to imagine the odds are against me. Well, you're, you've been beating the odds the last few years. So we'll see. <laughs> All right. Let's hit you with another, uh, another deep question. This is another great one. This is coming again from Jana. So her question is, what do you use to help you dig deep when things get tough? Um, so, okay. So I'll answer that first with racing. Um, when I'm racing or when I'm doing a workout and I start faltering, um, I try to, my, the basic tool I use is I try to focus inward and I focus, I have like a pattern. I go one, two, three, one, two, three. I used to be a musician. And so it's kind of like counting in threes, but with my feet, right? And so it's right, left, right, left, right, left, right? So you're, the downbeat is kind of an alternate foot. Um, Cause you do one, two, three, four, then you're always focusing on your right and you're landing too much on one side, not the other. So it's good to have an odd number. And so it's, it's like a mantra. Um, and I use that, that's helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm racing, I try, sometimes I'll try to say, okay, let's like, let's just, all right, things are going badly. I'm just going to, I'm going to catch that person up ahead or right. I'm going to try to, uh, I'm not going to worry about 
you know, mile 26, I'm going to mile, worry about mile 22. Let's just make sure I can get through mile 22 in whatever time, right? And like right. kind of narrow the task down. Um, and I think it's related to that in like work or life, which is okay. And, and to some degree, this my, my colleagues fault me on this, but it's very much like, um, you know, okay, here's a problem. Like, okay, let's, let's, okay, great. That's, that's the problem. Let's, okay, so what is the thing we do right now, right? Like, mm -hmm. this sounds like we can't solve it. This sounds impossible. Um, you know, I had a conversation about something today where it was like, oh my God, how are we going to solve this, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, what can we do next, right? What is the, there's this, this, this quote from, I wrote this book, you mentioned in the intro, The Hawk and the Dove about Paul Nitza and George Kennan. And it's the history of America during the Cold War as told through the rivalry of those two men. And Kennan had this incredible observation, which is if you study history and you look at anything that went badly, right? It's the result of about 15 things in a row going wrong. Um, mm -hmm. And you look at it and you say, well, okay, so if we could just have changed one of those things, right, then it wouldn't have gone wrong. And he said, but if you reverse it, then if you think about anything that goes right, it's a series of things going right in a row. So mm -hmm. what it means is that no matter where you are and no matter how badly things are going or how hard something looks, what you need to do is to just reverse it and do the next thing right, right? So if everything has gone wrong up to this point, like do the next thing right, right? And that'll set you up for the next one and the next one, the next one. And then ideally you create a chain or a bunch of things go right in the right direction. And so that's like, that's a way out of really hard problems. It's the way like, mm -hmm. Okay, I'm feeling like crap in the race. I'm, you know, I'm feeling terrible in the race. Like, okay, let's just get like the next two minutes. Let's do the next two minutes where like my head is clear and I'm running as well as I can. So that's that's how I try to get through hard situations. That's an incredible answer. Jana, I hope you're taking notes on that. I definitely <laughs> am. <laughs> Seriously, I again I just I have to say, like, I just love how we can learn these things in running. And then you're faced with these things every day. I mean, life is, yeah. is not a piece of cake. So being able to use some of these things in everyday life is just, it's incredible. So um, Nick, what would you say, this is a question about your job. We've talked about, you know, running for the majority of this. What would you say, like, why do you love what you do? You obviously are passionate about it. Um, what is it that drives you? And you, and, you know, you're performing at a high level in running and at your job. So would you talk about that, about your career? And, and what is it that's kind of driven you over the years? What is it that you love about what you get to do every day? Yeah. So for most of my career, my job, you know, up until five years ago, or maybe nine years ago, or to a certain degree, even up until now, has been just journalism. And so it's finding stories and I, sometimes it's finding stories that other people write and I edit. Sometimes it's finding stories that I write myself. And so that's curiosity, right? You know, it's this wonderful opportunity to find something interesting and learn about it or you know, find something wrong in the world that you can try to correct by telling a story about it or find an interesting story and entertain people with it. And so it's like, it's just this wonderful kind of mental curiosity. And so... What motivates me in my early career is that journalism is an amazing profession for understanding the world, thinking about the world, going to new places. Um, you know, and I've always been a sort of a, a curious person who liked to do different things. Then gradually I've moved more into management. And so in some ways it's like recognizing that there's a real economic problem for my business, right? Journalism is in terrible financial straits, right? Um, and, but if I can help solve that problem, if I can you know, make the New Yorker more sustainable, if I can help make Wired more sustainable, if I can make the Atlantic more sustainable, I'm creating an opportunity for more people to do journalism and for these publications that play a pretty important role in America, you know, some degrees to the world, like helping them make civic discourse better, make democracy function better, make us understand technology better so that mm -hmm. we can make better choices about technology. And so, you know, over the last five or 10 years has been a realization that maybe my talents are primed for that question, right? Trying to mm -hmm. set, make these publications sustainable. So it's a different set of motivations depending on the different job and the different stage of life I've been in. But I think that's, that's where it comes from. And I have to ask you, I know we're going to backtrack a little bit, but what was it that kind of inspired you to get into all this way back when? Um, you talked a little bit about your time at college, but uh, yeah. I'm so interested to know the answer to that. 
you know, that's, it's a perplexing one sometimes when I look back, right? And I, I, um, I liked writing in college, right? And I wrote for the school paper, I wrote opinion columns, but I wasn't a reporter. Um, and then I finished college and I kind of thought I was going to work for an environmental organization, right? My plan was to work for, you know, Sierra Club, Environmental Defense Fund, and go to graduate school, study economics, get a PhD in environmental economics. And that was what my college degree had been in. You know, it was, it was out, in, out in California. Um, and I didn't end up on that path. And honestly, it was partly because I couldn't get a job. <laughs> Like I, I really couldn't get hired by any organization, even, you know, to any basic job. Um, and I think it's partly because it's just hard to, hard to get a job, hard to get paid to do that. And, but for someone like me, it was kind of easier to get hired as a journalist. And so I wrote freelance stories, you know, I had interesting things happen to me. Um, I wrote about them. I wrote a, you know, I knew, I, knew about various things. I wrote my first big article about Thai currency markets and that helped me get hired at the Washington Monthly. And then the way life works in your 20s, which is, you know, when I started the Washington Monthly, I was 24 years old. I don't think if you asked me, I don't have a diary of that period. Like, I don't think I thought I would stay in journalism my whole life. Um, mm -hmm. So I kind of stumbled into it in part because the the, the different things that I was pursuing then, like I thought maybe I'd work for a computer company. I thought maybe I'd be a musician. I thought I'd work for an environmental organization. None of those was totally working out. The music thing was pretty good, but not fantastic. And then I got hired to this awesome journalism job. And then I decided I loved it and stayed in it. And here we are 22 years later. Mm. I love on your, um, you know, I've been bouncing around on various sites for bios for you. I, I, I don't know if it was Wikipedia or maybe it was your website where it was included that you were fired on your first day. Yeah. Like, first of all, I just love that that's included in your bio because people reading that can say, well, look where he is now, you know? Um, yeah, so, okay, so that's interesting, right? So I was, I, after college, I you know, met someone and talked to them and they hired me as an associate producer at 60 Minutes, which is, was a great job. Um, and I showed up for work and the head of it, this guy, Phil Scheffler, was like, who are you? I was like, I'm Nick Thompson. He's like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm the new associate producer. I'm working under Steve Croft. And he was like, what have you done in journalism before? I was like, nothing. Um, and he's like, can I see your resume? And so I print out my resume. And my resume is like, you know, Nick got good grades in college, right? And started the Stanford mountain running team, right? It's not like the resume of an associate producer at 60 Minutes. Right. And so he fired me on the spot. Um, and, you know, it was total garbage, right? Like I've been hired, right? I went through the interview process and they'd hired me for some reason or another. They thought I was charming, saw potential, whatever reason. Um, but I didn't recognize to what degree it was garbage. I didn't fight. I just was like, whoa, that's weird. I just got fired, right? I guess I'll go talk my way into another job. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, I couldn't get hired into another job. Um, so I still like, have very complicated feelings about, about that weird moment. Yeah. Ben, this is a fun coda to it. Maybe 15 years later, um, I'm at the Livingston Awards, the awards for you know, best young journalist under 35. And the guy who wins it, um, I had edited him and assigned him a story at the New Yorker. And he gives a speech praising me. And Steve Croft is the head of the Livingston Awards. And I see Steve Croft and we're in the elevator going down afterwards. And I was, he's like, ah, he's like, you're the guy who was praised in the speech. And I was like, yeah, you know, I worked for you for one hour. <laughs> and he was like, He's like, oh my God, you're the kid that son of a bitch fired. He's like, I couldn't remember. It was kind of amazing that he remembered like that, like that horrible story that must have been passed around CBS. Of, oh, I'm sure. So yeah, I, I had a pretty, pretty inglorious beginning to my journalism career. I, I was dying to ask if you ever had another interaction with him, but I guess you did. Well, I did with Steve, but the, you know, the person who fired me, Phil Scheffler, I didn't. Um, you know, which is a bummer because I wish he had like, it, later I became a, like a correspondent for CBS, right? I'm talking on CBS this morning and CBS Sunday morning. Like I'd had a pretty good, pretty good reputation inside that organization, but he was, he was deceased by then. I w but I wish he had like, what an asshole. Anyway, sorry, <laughs> I digress. <laughs> it's a good story though. I mean, you've got a good story from it. Yeah, it was, it was a good story. It was a good story. In retrospect, it's, in retrospect, I'm glad to have that story in my portfolio of stories, but God, <laughs> that was a rough day. Oh, it's probably an understatement.
Yeah. Um, okay, we've got another question. I, I love my friend Kaylin. She has such great questions every week when we do these interviews. So Kaylin wants to know, have you had a business mentor or several in your career, business, or life? Or if not, what has been your North Star? In quotations. Um, yeah, so I've had a lot of mentors and I've had some really great bosses in my life and I've been extraordinarily fortunate. So I started at the, um, at the um, Washington Monthly and my boss was this guy, Charlie Peters, sort of a legendary journalism mentor. And he, he taught me all kinds of things about journalism. He taught me all kinds of things about work. He taught me all kinds of, I mean, he's just a wonderful, wonderful man. And he's, he's 93 years old. Wow. I mean, email about one of the stories I wrote. <laughs> Just the other day, I'm going to go see him in Washington next week. Um, so I was very lucky to have to have him. I had an incredible boss at this place called Legal Affairs, man named Lynn Kaplan. Uh, and I worked at the New Yorker, and so I worked under David Remnick, who was one of the you know great journalists of all time and one of the great people of all time. And he he was definitely the person who I most you know tried to model. You know, if I was in a tough situation, so I think, okay, what would David do? Mm -hmm. um, he was you know both the best journalist you can imagine, the best writer, and also like the kindest person and the smartest person. And so trying to be like David or trying to be, you know, a shadow of what David was, um, or, you know, the, the five cent version of David Remnick is a very useful aspiration. Uh, and it's good too, it's a good lesson that the guy who was the editor in chief was also the best writer at the New Yorker. And so trying to study the way he wrote was a very useful way to improve writing. So he was a great mentor and a great role model. So I've, I've been blessed to have Really, and you know, and then my boss at Wired, Anna Wintour, who I adored, mm. um, and you know, I learned a lot from from all those people. Do you have opportunity now in your life to mentor other folks? Like, are you able to kind of pay it forward, or is your job just so crazy right oh, now? I hope so. I hope I hope that there are people who I've worked with who uh, who think they've learned a thing or two from me, and I learned I learned from them. I mean, I certainly hired a lot of people at the Atlantic who I worked with. I hired a lot of people who, multiple times. So at the very least, like there are people I'm, people who can tolerate me. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I hope, I, I hope the answer to that is yes, but it's not for me to answer. I'm, I'm confident the answer is yes. <laughs> well, Nick, we're getting down to the end. I would love to hit you with our rapid fire questions. How do you feel okay. about that? Bring it. I just got a text from my wife that I got to put my kids to bed. So bring them on. Perfect. All right. Then we'll wrap up with this. It's right at nine. So we'll hit you with the rapid fire. You want to, you just want to say the first thing that comes to your mind. Uh, right. These are very serious questions. Okay. okay. Bring it. So the first one is, do you believe in Sasquatch? Yes. All right. You passed. <laughs> All right. Next one. We'll go quick. What uh, shoe are you currently running in? For road, for road road i like the nike peg turbos uh the new balance fuel cell rebels um and the hoka carbons so i run those three basically alternating them favorite socks for trail running um i like bandit run socks all-time favorite trail that you've been on sergeant mountain south ridge trail wow no hesitation with that one when you trail run, do you use a running pack? And if you do, what type of a pack? I use a little, um, I use a little fanny pack with, um, which I keep you know, gels and stuff in. But if it's a short enough trail run, I don't like if it's, but if it's a long one, you know, keep fanny pack and phone in there. Okay. Do you have a bucket list race on your mind? You can go oh. anywhere. Um, not really. I mean, I would love to run, I really want to run the London Marathon because mm -hmm. it'll be two years in a row I haven't been able to, um, but it's not quite bucket list. Oh, I'd love to run the Mount Washington Road Race. I've never been able to get into that. Oh, I know some of our, our viewers have done that a few times. I know yeah. Janet's done it. Um, okay, and next one is, do you have a bucket list destination that you would like to go travel to? I want to go back to Ghana. I spent a lot of time in Ghana in my 20s and I haven't been back since the kids were born. So. I want to go back. And I guess this would be related to that. I have never, three times in my life, I've thought I was going to hike Mount Kenya and I haven't been able to hike Mount Kenya for whatever bureaucratic reason. So I want to go hike Mount Kenya. Okay, we've got two more questions. 
what is the number one food item you have the biggest regret over eating during a run? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> um, Do you ever have a gut bomb? I don't think I've ever had a specific reaction to a specific thing, which is strange. Um, I've had, certainly I've had lots of, you know, like stomach aches and all that. Um, I, I don't know. I don't have a good answer to that one. Okay. All right. And last question, this will be about your kids. What is the last thing that was like the funniest thing you can think of that your, one of your kids did? Uh, it was during our baseball game where this is an hour ago we've got the stuffed animals set up as bases mm -hmm. and he was on second base and he ran to third base and I tagged him and said he was out and he said no because he was holding the stuffed animal that was second base <laughs> but <laughs> technically on base and he planned to drop it when he got to third nailed it <laughs> uh your family sounds like they're they're a riot they're very fun so Nick, this has been a, just a delight. I have loved it. The hour went by so fast. And um, thank you so much for your time tonight. And thanks so much for inviting me on. Maybe, uh, maybe my bucket list race will be to come race here one of your crazy races sometime in the near future. Hey, I think, you know, the Backyard Squatch might have your name on it for next year. Sounds great. I'll come do it with my kids. They can do one and I'll try to do, you know, a few more than that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the goal. That's yeah. the goal. Okay. So, um, Nick, why don't you tell people how can they um, how can they follow you on social media, or do you have a um, you know you can share your website, social media links? What would you like to share with them? Yeah, I'm all over social media. Usually, it's NX Thompson. That's Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, my website is www.nickthompson.com. My music's there, and articles are there. And you should subscribe to the Atlantic. There it is. I'm glad you said that. So, all right, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. If you're watching live, thank you so much for your questions. We really got a lot of solid questions tonight. Um, and if you are listening to this on our podcast, thank you for tuning in. You can subscribe to our podcast as well. Learn more about Sasquatch Trail Running, visit sasquadtrailrunning.com. And uh, until we see you again, keep it squatchy. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs>